A state of emergency in Ethiopia after the sudden resignation of the Prime Minister. I have decided by my own will and submitted my resignation to leave my responsibilities with EPRDF and the government. So who will replace him and what next for Ethiopia? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Martine Dennis. Now, Haile Mariam Dessalen's surprise resignation came after sustained anti-government protests across this vast East African country. While the government considers who will take his place, it's imposed a state of emergency for the next six months. Laura Burden Manley has more. The streets of Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa, appear calm. But the country's political establishment is in crisis. In a surprise move, Prime Minister <coughs> Haile Mariam Dessalane stepped down from office on Thursday, becoming the first leader in modern Ethiopia to do so. The EPRDF and the government are undertaking an ongoing reform, and we know that we are in the process of achieving these reforms. I myself want to become part of the solution with the reforms. I have decided by my own will and submitted my resignation to leave my responsibilities with EPRDF and the government. The following day, Ethiopia's ruling EPRDF coalition imposed a six-month state of emergency. The move aims to stem the wave of massive anti-government protests in Ethiopia's largest regions, Oromia and Amhara, in recent months. Young men armed with rocks and sticks have blocked roads demanding political reforms, an end to state corruption and the release of all political prisoners. The government responded this year by freeing 6,000 opposition supporters from jail. But the protests continued. Eskindaniga was one of those released. Ethiopia is one large prison. I say this because there is no democracy in the country. This is a dictatorship. We have to change this big prison into a democratic state. Opposition leaders say Ethiopia's ruling coalition has lost its moral authority. They say the larger ethnic groups are being dominated by the smaller groups, meaning the majority have become the marginalized. They're demanding all parties get an equal say in the country's future. Renegotiation. You know, this country is a country of 100 million. It is too big for one political group, you know, for one group, small group uh, to run the affairs of 100 million people. Many see protests as the only way to bring about meaningful change. The ruling coalition is expected to meet within days to choose a successor to Desalen. The decision will have a huge impact on how Ethiopia is governed. <laughs> Laura Badamamli, Al Jazeera. Well, Ethiopia is the second most populous country on the African continent with 100 million people. There are more than 40 different ethnic groups. The two largest groups, the Oromo and the Amhara, make up around two thirds of all Ethiopians. Tigrayans account for just 6% of the population, but they dominate politics and the security forces. It's a 25-year-old arrangement, but one that is causing a great deal of resentment among the other groups. Right, let's introduce our guests now. Here in Doha with me is Harry Verhoeven, who's a professor of government at Georgetown University, Qatar. In Washington, D.C., we have Mohamed Ademo, founder and editor of opride.com. That's an independent news website about the Oromo and indeed about his country, Ethiopia. So welcome to you both. Uh, let me start with you, Mohamed. You're in Washington, D.C., but obviously uh, there is a job vacancy going in your country. Um, who should be considered? What are the qualities that are needed to, to fill Haile Mariam's shoes? Uh, I think the ruling party, uh, Haile Mariam's party, faces a legitimacy crisis. And the qualifications for the next uh, leader who will take over from him uh, has to be that someone who can uh, reclaim that popular legitimacy, but most importantly, that can unite the party itself because there are deep uh, fissures within the party. And also someone who has the gravitas 
to unite the country, jumpstart a much needed political dialogue with the opposition, including some of the people who uh, are who who just got released fr from prison. Uh, but you know, obviously, uh, other leadership qualities and, and, and experience is important. But those things are important to put the country back on a path toward a more sustainable uh, future. Mohammed, does he need to be in Oromo? I think, uh, uh, as you've noted in your report there, the, uh, the Ethiopian government and, and, and this party has faced relentless protest at least since 2014. That refuses to go away, despite the fact that the government declared a state of emergency in 2016, which lasted for 10 months. Those protests were started in Oromia, and the demands, as you know, include, among other things, political marginalization. There is a historic Oromo grievance in that country, where despite being the majority in that country, uh, in, in despite being in an area of the country that is really considered the breadbasket of the country itself, the Oromos have not had political leadership. I think there is no question that Ethiopia is ready for an Oromo prime minister. This is the time. And, and uh, several opportunities were missed in Ethiopia's history, and certainly under this All right. uh, administration okay, to Mohammed. put an Oromo prime minister in that position. If, this is if that they were to go for it, if the EPRDF were to go for an Oromo prime minister, would that stop the protests? Would the Oromo people be content? Uh, the, the, that's not going to be enough. I think the, the change of guard at the top is not going to cut it. Ethiopia uh, <coughs> is a very repressive state. There, it has to be followed by political reforms, and this leader has to be someone who has popular legitimacy among the Oromo, and also someone who can inspire confidence uh, in the country as a whole, because Oromo being the majority, there is this uh, concern about what is called in academic circles the tyranny of the majority, uh, and then also uh, the rise of Romo nationalism it scares some people. Someone who can inspire confidence in other people in the country that Oromos can actually lead this country uh, toward uh, uh, put the country back on a stronger footing. Uh, I think it has to be someone uh, qualified for, for, for that, and certainly someone who's willing to uh, uh, reach across the aisle, talk to the opposition, and, 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 and chart a vision, really, for, for the future uh, uh, of a country that is democratic uh, and, and, and more united, because the, the lack of application of the Constitution, in this case, the lack of self-rule for states, has been the battle cry of protesters All right. I, my entire I want to, life. I want to jump I in think, there, and uh, I just want, to ask, you, I want to, to ask you something really, really quickly. Do you have a name in mind? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, it is not my choice, but the, the choice of the people of Oromo, and largely uh, of the Amara people, and, and, and certainly other groups in Ethiopia, is Lama Magarsa, the president of uh, Oromia Regional All right. State. Thank who, you. Who uh, has made bold stakes to Ethiopian unity and in, in, uh, pledged democratization. Mohammed, thank you very much. That's what I wanted to get out of you. And I want to put that now to Harry. Harry, is the EPRDF, and, and perhaps more, more uh, accurately, uh, the TPLF within that ruling coalition prepared uh, to cede power to a majority figure, uh, somebody who represents the Oromo people? I think it depends. I think there are certainly people within the party, including within the TPLF, who understand that they've really reached a fork in a row, then this is a very dangerous moment. And that if they're not careful in how they will proceed next, uh, many of the gains that have been built up over the last uh, 20, uh, 25 years or so risk being washed away. So in that sense, I think that, yes, there is a sense amongst many people within the party that perhaps the time is right for an Oromo, if only for the reason that there's been a sense that Oromos have been complaining for a long time and standing by the sidelines and always saying, oh, what about us, what about this? It's very different being prime minister where, as Mohammed rightly said, you've got to forge a compromise, you've got to show that you take everybody's concerns to heart, that you don't favor one group over another. And so there has been, for a long time now, a minority, but an increasingly growing minority within the party that has been saying, OK, these Aromas have been complaining for a long time. Let's give it to them right now. Let's see what, what, what we can do. Provided, of course, that there are a number of, of guarantees that are given. 
Uh, many of the privileges, again, that Mohammed has referred to will not be eroded overnight. That's almost impossible. It's dominance of the security services, grip on certain sectors of the economy, etc. Um, so there probably will have to be some kind of transition there too. But I think that the party is certainly readier than it was two years ago or five years ago. Um, it sounds very much, Mohammed, let me come back to you in, in uh, DC. It sounds very much to me as though uh, Ethiopia is at a crossroads uh, that many people are describing the country as being in a state of crisis at the moment. I don't know if you'd agree with that and whether you think uh, that this is perhaps a seminal moment uh, for the running of the country. Absolutely. But, you know, if I may, if, uh, first, I think, uh, on what Harry said, I don't think Oromos have been unfairly complaining uh, about uh, lacking or being marginalized from the center in Ethiopia. This has been going on for close to a century, and I don't want to go through this, the, the history of it. But I think the uh, concerns of marginalization for Oromo is not just complaints, or uh, I think it is very much warranted, and I think we should yeah, be but very Mohammed, careful with I think, Mohammed, of... many of the other groups, many of the other groups in Ethiopia can have uh, exactly the same the same complaint as well. Let's just get on with where you think the country is at this particular moment and whether you think that there is enough momentum for there to be positive change, positive in terms of, of Oromo aspirations and perhaps the Amhara. The Amhara, uh, the second biggest group, are also uh, sitting on the sidelines with a great deal of discontent. They've also been protests in the Amhara regions. No, absolutely. I think the country is at a dangerous crossroads, actually. And, and uh, what the government is doing is taking one step forward and two steps back. And, and the release of political prisoners and journalists, and, and some of whom were really the, the core celebre of the protesters, was a very positive step forward. And, and there are discussions of reform within the military, within the security sector, in the judiciary, which now really is the instrument of the executive branch. Those are positive steps. But when you declare a, step of, a state of emergency a day after you release these prisoners, that sort of sends a mixed signal. But if the authorities are really serious about what they're saying, that they want a national dialogue, and they want to talk to the opposition. They want to move the country forward towards a more democratic path and expand the democratic space for the young people that you see on the street to voice their grievances, to have avenues for, the, for grievances, to feel like they belong and they have a future in this country. And they want to be at the, at the table to, stake, to have a stake, a say in, in what that future looks like. If they were to do that, I think they have a, a, an excellent opportunity to move the country forward. Not only that, to rewrite it its own legacy, which has been characterized by repression and, and heavy handedness. But if they continue to send mixed signals, th there is a risk here that things could go south, we could see a bloodshed, and, 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 and the government uh, would collapse. And, and, and certainly there are signs of that because within the party, the divisions are deep. Uh, uh, the OPDO, and as you mentioned, the Amara National Democratic Movement have formed an alliance uh, to really challenge some of the more entrenched security in the military uh, uh, intelligence uh, sectors, which are dominated by ethnic Tigrayans who have controlled those institutions for the last 27 years. So I think what they do next in what this state of emergency means in how soon they move to install a successor for Haile Mariam and instill in, uh, confidence in people uh, in, to make sure that... Because I'll give you an example. All right, well, Yesterday, hang on, hang on a minute, a hang on a minute, hang uh, on a minute. Let's get to your example a bit later on. Let me now go to Harry. And Harry... Um, in his resignation speech, Hali Mariam Dessalen said that he hoped, and I paraphrase, mm. that his resignation would actually help the, the, the country move forward mm -hmm. and implement some, some reforms, democratic reforms. Um, is he right? And will this happen? Well, it's certainly a first. You know, Ethiopian leaders historically do not leave power voluntarily. They certainly do not announce their resignation on, on national television or national radio. So in that sense, it is an important step in and of itself. It is also certainly true that it's, I think it became very obvious in the last year or so that um, the needed reforms were not going to happen under this prime minister, that this prime minister 
lacked both the ability, perhaps also the willingness, and there's still some debate as to what, to what extent he was really on board with many of these, these reforms. So he was not going to be the one to, to certainly not see them through. So you don't think that the release of political prisoners was a sign of strength, a sign of the fact that Haile Mariam wanted to move forward with the reforms, open up the political space? I don't necessarily think that fell under his portfolio. And I, I think many, many people who watch Ethiopia, inside and outside Ethiopia, will know that this is not necessarily the prime minister's decision or th this prime minister's decision. Um, but so I think that potentially this could be a very positive step. I mean, um, it, it very much depends on, on the internal party deliberations that are happening. What, what I, where I am, I'm cautious, of course, that the party has a long tradition of Marxist, Leninist order and, and control. Um, and continues to believe that fundamentally it is a vanguard that understands where the country should, should head and that many ordinary people do not. And that, of course, is fundamentally not a very democratic way of, of looking at it. Um, and that represents, I think, a very, a very serious obstacle, even with those people who say, nominally speaking, that they commit to reform. The mindset remains one of people ultimately must follow and the leadership decides. And that culture, that political culture, it's not just something that's, that's within the party, but it's particularly prevalent Absolute, there, absolutely. is important. Harry, at this point, um, it will be quite useful, I think, for us to explain, to look mm. at this term, ethnic federalism, which, of course, is the system under which Ethiopia has been governed for around 25 years or so. It was the vision of the former prime minister, of course, the, uh, uh, the architect, if you like, of modern Ethiopia, Mele Sanawi. Explain what it is in simple terms. Well, very simply put, it was Meles's answer to the fundamental problem that Ethiopia in the 19th century was an empire in which many different population groups, ethnic groups, linguistic groups, religious groups were violently in incorporated. And so then the question posed itself, of course, what kind of identity and what kind of political structures do you build up to manage this diversity? Now, Mohammed is right by saying that, roughly speaking, for most of Ethiopian history, the, I the central idea has been the assimilation to one identity, an Amhara identity, often a Christian Orthodox identity, and one of a unitary state under the control of a strong leader. What Medezanawi tried to do when he instituted this idea of, of ethnic federalism, coming from one of the minority groups that had been forced to assimilate to, to this identity, was to say, let's give people all around Ethiopia the right to speak their own language, to enjoy education in that language, to manage their business with government in that language, to self-govern. And this was an idea, I think, that originally was quite popular, not necessarily at the center of power. Many people saw it as dangerously weakening Ethiopia, but at least it was seen by many marginalized groups, including many Oromo at the time, as something that might potentially empower it. As we're seeing from many of the protests today, that's not quite how it plays. So it's not working? Well, again, it depends on, on who you ask. I mean, for example, take the Somali region in the eastern part of Ethiopia. There are many people who undoubtedly are still very unhappy with being part of Ethiopia, but there are also many people who will tell you that in many ways they've never had it so good. They've never had this kind of representation in the central government. They've never had the right to speak their own language. They've never had the kind of business interests and presence in the security services that they have today. These are not small things, and the same applies to many people in, in Oromia. Yes, many people are very unhappy with the heavy-handed way in which the government has dealt with it. They feel excluded from a lot of decision-making. But on the other hand, there have never been so many Oromo kids in school, never so many Oromo families connected to the national electricity grid. And so those are real gains, and I think that it's important to see that nuance, that rather than portraying the, the protest as a simple government versus the people's story, that we understand here that there is a political struggling happening within the party and within different branches of the party, as well as between different branches well, that, of the public. Well, that's, that's very interesting. So, Mohammed, would you agree with Harry, then, and would you, would you say that uh, the current state of, of discontent in Ethiopia is actually a challenge to the way the country is governed, uh, to the, to the ruling coalition itself? Would you, would you go that far? Or is it just that the Oromia would like a, a larger share of the pie? Uh, no, I would slightly disagree. I, I think uh, ethnic federalism gets a bad rap in the media a lot uh, in, in, in is, is picking up some currency in academic circles. But I think, uh, first of all, I think ethnic federalism was a compromise, not necessarily uh, Malazenawi's vision, a compromise among different uh, uh, ethnic-based liberation movements that overthrew the uh, communist regime in 1991. And it was the only way to hold the country together. Eritrea voted to go for independence. There were groups fighting for Oromo independence. There were groups fighting for Tigray independence. So ethnic federalism was as a way to say, let's stay together, build the country, a, a union that all of us can coexist together. But something happened along the way. They promised decentralization 
two states, ethnic-based homeland states, but that never came. So I think the problem is not necessarily the design of the system, which has worked greatly uh, uh, for, for the most part in terms of the cultural revival you see, in, in terms of uh, the development of some of the language that were essentially ba banned from public use uh, under previous administrations, uh, and, and then suddenly g giving people at the grassroots, people that you see protesting, uh, the, the sort of power that they feel now that uh, they can demand their rights. I think th th there are positive things. What happened, though, is the, the, the power remained centralized at the top. And Harry is absolutely right earlier when he pointed out the, the ruling party's culture. That comes from the sort of the uh, communist tradition of cent uh, democratic centralism, where decisions flow from the party. The party can have debates internally, but once you leave the room, you have to agree to what the party says. All right. That really made uh, cripple the, the, the state, and, and, and ethnic, ethnic federalism has never been really fully tested as it was written in the All Constitution. All right. What is, what is the, the, uh, the, the, the prognosis, then, from your point of view? I know that you're in, you're in Washington, D.C., but I know that you're very well connected uh, with events in, in Oromia, in Ethiopia. What is your uh, prognosis for the short term? Uh, I, I think, uh, as I said at the top of the show, uh, the, the Ethiopia is ready for an Oromo prime minister, and, and the choices are clear. It has to come from the Oromo People's Democratic uh, 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 Organization, the OPDO, and there are only two, two names that people will accept. That is Lama Magersa and his deputy, Dr. Abiy Ahmed. And I think it, they owe to the Ethiopian people in, in this, at uh, this dangerous and very precarious uh, moment where, as I alluded to earlier, people think that the prime minister's resignation meant uh, that the government has collapsed and there was a bit of an anarchy in the part of the country yesterday because people thought there was a power vacuum and, and they started burning prisons. And, All right, we're running, and, and it, we're running out of other, time, Mohammed. Uh, so so I'd, I'd like to move this on quickly then and, and come to Harry and say, if um, the EPRDF is not prepared just yet mm. to put uh, an Oromo in the Prime Minister's chair, what will happen? I mean, there's a state of emergency which they've said is going to be in place for six months. No, it is. And, and, and undoubtedly, there will be an attempt to restart some of these demonstrations, both by people themselves, but also, as I've alluded to earlier, by certain elements within the party that have been actively instrumentalizing these demonstrations, including very senior figures in the OPDO who have had a very double speak at, at times. Um, but I don't think that we should underestimate the security services. These security services have an incredibly long and, from their point of view, very successful track record of maintaining order, who are willing to pay a high price. I mean, this is a a country where for a very long time the security services have had very little qualms about locking up thousands of people, about sometimes, uh, if they deem necessary, killing very large numbers of people. So I think it is also very important that, that the opposition, both the opposition in government, if you like, and the opposition outside government, think very carefully about, the, about those steps because um, if the, the very people at the top of the security services feel that they're back against the wall, that they're running out of options and that they may lose absolutely everything, I don't think that they will hesitate and, and open fire. And that would be a catastrophe for ordinary Ethiopians, but also for the region as a whole. I mean, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Eritrea, all in many ways need a stable Ethiopia, um, economically, politically, security-wise. So there's, it is oh. a very important moment. All right, we're out of time. Mohamed Ademo, thank you very much indeed from Washington, D.C. Harry Verhoeven here in the studio with me. Thank you very much indeed. And before we go, just to let you know that we did try to get a government voice, the Ethiopian government, to contribute to the programme, but unfortunately we weren't able to. Thank you for watching the show. You can see it again anytime you like by going to the website, aljazeera.com. Should you want more discussion, there's always our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And there's a Twitter sphere, our handle at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Martine Dennis. From me and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now.